So the other issue I alluded to earlier, and this is, I guess, one of the critical parts of our intellectual property, so I can't give away too much about it because, um, you know, it's a brave statement to say, but we believe we've solved the billion dollar SOA question about granularity, okay? The first in the world to do so. I'm going to give you a couple of hints now, certainly not at the conference in Melbourne. I wasn't going to give away the kitchen sink. Um, in fact, most of the people who work for me who are far more commercially minded than I am um, actually weren't, didn't want me to speak at the conference at all because I said, you're going to give away too much. You're going to tell away too much. Do not do it. Do not do it. Um, so they vetted me very, very strongly about what I was and was not allowed to say. So I'm going to give you one example of, of how we produce these things in a minute, but only that, a hint if you like, the door opening. But so forget for the moment, as I said, I'll give you one example, how we come up with these red boxes, okay? But these red, bo these red things drawn on top of this business capability model is a core concept called service containers, okay? And again, I'll tell you at least one, one of the contributing factors that goes into determining where the right service containers are for your organization in a second, okay? But once you have them, okay, the issue of addressing service granularity is solved forever for your organization. It is a simple engineering exercise from that point forward. I continue to decompose my business process until a business individual process step can be delivered by a single service container. The functionality required and the data required for that, that, that process step can be addressed by the functionality out of a single service container. Stop. I have now finished my process design and I start on service design. That is the service. That is the right granularity for the service. It is really that simple. Okay, coming up with these boxes is not, okay, designing where these boxes sit and determining the right service containers for your organization is where the complexity lies. But that's a once-off exercise, done once. Once it's done and done right, you never have to address this question again. Every solution architect, every designer knows exactly what the right answer is for a service granularity. As soon as I hit the right, a service container, I'm done. That's a service. Everything else, like everything that spans service container. A question, hallelujah. Yes, sir. But how do you know that the, your service, uh, service granularity is the exact match to your service container? What's your criteria? Because according to some business, it is something else, but according to you, it's some, something, something else. So okay, I, I think I'm going to answer your question. Well, the short answer to your question is by putting the right level of rigor into the design of the service containers. But I, I actually think I'll answer, the, the one example I'm going to give you the, of that door into our intellectual property actually addresses that question, I think. So you're going to see it right now in a minute, okay? Um, I'm pretty sure anyway, if I haven't, I'll come back to it, if I haven't addressed it in, in, in the next slide. Um, and yes, I'll just quickly check my notes to make sure there was nothing I was missing on that point before I move off. No, I think, there, think, we're, think we're done there. Um, I'm sorry, the, 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 the point I was going to make is, and this is where the level of rigor that you apply to a business capability model becomes critical. Okay, if you want to use a business capability model, there are two things it could be used for, okay? Let's generically talk about a capability model. It can be used for what we call business consulting. High level strategic analysis of an organization, ensuring they're spending their right money in their right places, doing making sure the, it's, it's an input to the investment and prioritization process. If you like the business consulting use of a business capability model, all of the major players all use capability models for that, usually from their business consulting arms. Business consulting services would use their capability model to sit down with an organization, have conversations about where they should be spending their money, where their competitive advantage lies, and those type of things. And we use it for that purpose as well. In fact, one of the first things that one Jamie McPhee, the Adelaide Bank former CEO, over to our whole approach, and then when he left to come down to CEO of ME Bank, asked us to come down there with them, was a simple two overlays I did in the business capability model. A competitive advantage heat map that said, these are the capabilities where you should be above market, because they're core to, to Adelaide's competitive advantage and strate strategy. These are the capabilities where it's okay to be in market, and actually these capabilities, we don't care if we're worse than our competitors, we can be below market. And I then overlaid his IT spend for the previous five years. He went, Jesus, what are we doing? We're spending money everywhere except for where our core competitive advantage is. This is just insane. Now that simple heat map immediately won Jamie over to the whole concept of enterprise architecture. So that's that business consulting arm. But if you want to use it for what we would call deep architecture, resolving these questions of service granularity and determining where they should sit, there's an infinite more rigor that needs to be applied to the model. Okay. 
There's a whole pile of concepts that need to be brought to bear to, to develop a business capability model that aren't necessary for simple business consulting, but are absolutely mandatory if it's to be used for determining service containers and deep architecture design. Okay. There are probably in the order of 30 business inputs and about 50 technology inputs to determining the, the service containers. And in fact, probably in fairness, about 15 or 20 of those technology inputs are actually uh, assigned to how we designed the capability model in the first place. So credit risk decisioning, and uh, this is a heavily redacted version of a business capability model. And I just so delighted I got to use the word redacted in a presentation. <laughs> I was so delighted to say that in MCG as well. Not only the CIA get to redact things. Uh, so credit risk decisioning is a core capability in any bank, unless you're a US bank for about nine years when you abandoned it. But, but most banks actually do focus on credit risk decisioning. Um, and that's made up of effectively a few different things. I'm going to focus on two of them. Customer risk scoring. So what is Glenn Smith's likelihood of default? You know, Glenn Smith as a person, what's his likelihood of actually paying back the loan or not? Okay, you know, is Glenn Smith, how much earn he earns, yada, yada. And then there's transaction risk scoring, which is for this particular transaction, what is, what is the danger in this transaction, okay? Now, customer risk scoring, as it turns out, um, is uh, something that is standard across all products. My risk is my risk. It doesn't matter whether I'm applying for a house loan, a car loan, a margin loan. My risk is my risk. In fact, largely that's outsourced to a company credit agencies like Vida, something to look at personal individual risk, okay? Transaction risk, however, is fundamentally different across different business units. Okay, so am I asking for a $100,000 loan for a $3 million property in Burnside? Or am I asking for you know, a $250,000 loan for, against a $270,000 property in Elizabeth? Very different risk profiles for a bank. Okay, that's a transaction risk in a, in a mortgage sense. But in, in margin lending, am I asking for a, a margin loan against BHP Billiton Limited or am I asking for a margin loan against Dodgy Minor Inc.? Okay, so the transaction risk has a fundamentally different concept in mortgages as it does in, in margin lending. But customer risk is shared. So here's one of the most important, but only one of plenty, just enough for you to hang yourself if you try and do this without us. Uh, one of the most important decisions to where you draw service containers is where you're going to share or not share. As soon as you have, and I think this answered your question earlier, as soon as you have the need to have a different answer for an individual capability in different business units, transaction risk scoring, it forces the service container to be there. If you like, without having this concept, but concept had a service container around the whole of credit risk decisioning. So the process stopped and you went in to have a service to perform a credit risk decision, and they weren't getting any reuse, because it was at the wrong granularity entirely. As soon as you started implementing services, a customer risk score, a transaction risk score, there's other ones down here, which I won't say, but your other, as soon as you broke it down to that next level, the reuse started flowing immediately. Now, not only are you getting customer risk score being used across the whole company, but actually transaction risk score can now be used within each individual business unit. Yes, transaction risk score is, it gets lots of reuse inside mortgages and the margin lending version gets lots of reuse inside margin lending, but they won't be reused across the business units, obviously, because they're fundamentally different concepts. So, it's, so that forces the service containers to be down here. 